Let us pray. O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you for your creation, which reveals your eternal power and your divinity. We glorify you for the redemption that Jesus has accomplished by his death on the cross. And we give you thanks for the faith that you give and that you sustain by the work of the Holy Spirit. We humbly ask that you would open our ears so that we would hear your holy word, that you would prepare our hearts so that we would put our trust in you and in your promises, and that you would open our mouths to declare your praises. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen. Today we're going to meditate on one of the readings for the Feast of the Holy Trinity. But it's a reading that we don't usually read during our worship services. It is the reading of the psalm. Here is Psalm 8, which is uh, chosen for this occasion. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? and the Son of Man, that you care for him. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also all the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Here ends our reading. God created the heaven and the earth and everything that are within them. In this psalm, David is saying that in creation, we have the proof that the Lord should be praised, both for what exists here on earth and in the marvels throughout the universe. Creation is so wonderful that it deserves to be studied. Now, too often, we don't contemplate the world we live in. We just think, well, we take it for granted. I remember in elementary school, we had to draw the simple cell. And they told us there was the nucleus and the cytoplasma and the, uh, the plasmic membrane to keep it all together. It's not false, but a single cell living organism, even the most simple one, is much more complicated than that. Even a single cell organism is beyond our understanding. Recently, uh, a professor of microbiology, Olin Brown, and a professor of uh, uh, mechanic engineering and aerospace, uh, a man named David Hollander. They wrote, the survival of the fittest is illogical because it is proposed as a way of evolution that's adequate to select all the new types of bodies and functions, uh, metab the complex metabolic functions, that are important. 
because all of these changes are required in all sorts of multiple genomes, all require intermediate stages. And selection would never produce uh, in such a reasonable way these creatures. Because the disadvantage of death, logically, would win out. Because the biological process able to uh, foresee the future would be required. To put it other w- in another way, species didn't develop by chance, step by step. For example, let's look at the giraffe. The giraffe is known for its uh, long neck of two and a half meters long. Now, some people will say that, oh, his neck grew over centuries and millions of years so that it can reach the highest leaves in the branches. Now, if the development of his neck depended on time, on chance, and on random mutations, that doesn't explain the formation of his heart, which measures 60 centimeters to push the blood from its heart all the way up to its brain. And then you have to ask, what would happen if the giraffe lowered its head? The arterial pressure of such a big heart would cause blood vessels in his brain to explode and the giraffe would pass out, if not die. So, how does the giraffe avoid cerebral hemorrhages every time it bends down? there are a series of complex valves in its jugular veins which help to control the quantity of blood that arrives to the brain when the giraffe lowers its head. All of these functions require a plan and not random chances of of having a bigger heart or um, having a little bit longer neck No. All of these are required at the same time. Another example is the bombardier beetle, which shows the design of God. Now, this little insect is about one centimeter long, and it mixes chemical products that explode. Now, how would he have developed this ability without becoming his own victim, without blowing himself up? he has uh, firing chambers that are coated with um, asbestos. And these two little tubes um, can point in numerous directions. When it was filmed and they watched it in slow motion, it's as if there were a thousand miniature explosions, one after another. And they are so rapid that we only hear one single little pop. It's impossible for this process to evolve slowly and gradually to make this insect. He had to have all of these parts at the same time so that he would survive and be able to defend himself. May the Lord be praised for the marvel for his masterpiece that we call creation. And these marvels aren't just limited to what we see on earth, but the heavens declare the glory of God. And they they give witness to the work of his hands. How many intelligent people want to avoid the necessity of a creator? Not because there isn't proof for him, but because they are bullheaded. When you consider the objections of of stubborn people, the psalmist writes, out of the mouth of infants and babes, you have prepared your glory to confound your enemies, to silence your enemy and the man of vengeance. 
God will be praised. And if it's not by great people, the Lord will welcome the praises of children. In comparison, when you consider all that is in this universe, we are insignificant. We aren't the strongest. We aren't the most able to survive. My dog drinks water out of the river. I need water that has been cleaned. We're not like the wolf that can eat um, meat that, is, that has been uncooked. No, we have to cook it or um, preserve it in some way with salt or something else so that we don't get sick when we consume it. We're not more powerful than the bear or the lion or other great predators. We have to have tools and weapons to protect ourselves. We need to clothe ourselves because we don't have skins that have fur that would keep us warm as animals do. Nevertheless, we should give glory to God because, as David said, I praise you that I'm a creature that is fearfully and wonderfully made. God has made us. He has considered us. He acts in love in making us. And even if we are insignificant compared to all of the universe, God crowns us with glory and honor. David asks, What is man that you think of him? And the son of man that you care for him? Us, mere human beings. We're not just animals, as some people would say. We are creatures, but we are created in the image of God, by his grace. And God has given us a place of privilege in his creation, a role that has been entrusted to us to care for the earth and all that lives in it. Now, some people hear that, Lord has give, that the Lord has given us dominion over what his hands have made, and they use that to justify abusing animals or exploit, exploiting uh, things in an unjust way, or consuming without limit, or wasting garbage instead of trying to conserve it and reuse Instead, we should learn to see the world as the work of God and act as if it belongs to him. And the survival of the earth doesn't depend on us. But he has entrusted with us, he has entrusted us with a great responsibility, that of his servants. We can't control all things. But we can take care of what God grants to us. We are called to be faithful servants, to admire what he has created, and to praise him who is the source of life and the giver of all of these gifts. And yes, we recognize that God has crowned man with glory and honor because Jesus Christ true God from all eternity, entered into this creation. And he became one of us. He became man. Our dominion over the earth is the reflection of the fact that Christ reigns and has dominion from one ocean to the other. He has redeemed us and he has raised us up. That is the true elevation, that we might live with him eternally for the creation, for our salvation, and for the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, we say, Lord, our Lord, how great is your name in all the earth. In the name of God the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all of our human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds steadfast in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.